Are you struggling with roadblocks as a woman in the challenging and constantly changing world of corporate America? If you feel stuck in your career, you may be holding yourself back and may not even realize it. Prepare to be enlightened by the meaningful discussions here at the No Woman Left Behind podcast. Each week, gather the insight you need to break down those walls of limiting beliefs. Unleash your full potential and unlock the leader within. Listen to raw conversations with corporate women as they share inspiring stories with the purpose of obtaining their dream career and living a truly fulfilling life. Here's your host, Rosie Zielinskas. Hey everyone, welcome to the No Woman Left Behind show. I'm Rosie Zielinskas. Today we're going to be talking to Jane Westman, who is a leadership expert, and she understands how women hold themselves back in their careers. Jane Westman is an entrepreneur, marketing expert, and mentor. She is a president of Jane Westman Public Relations, based in New York City. Jane is one of the country's top book publicists with an impressive track record of creating national bestsellers, particularly in the areas of leadership, management, and personal growth. Jane is also a staunch supporter of working women, providing guidance as a writer, speaker, and consultant. Her book called Dive Right In, The Sharks Won't Bite, The Entrepreneurial Women's Guide to Success was one of the first to offer concrete advice to women to help them launch and grow their businesses. So let's take a listen and learn from Jane. Jane, thank you so much for being on the No Woman Left Behind podcast. I appreciate you being here. Jane, I'm gonna start asking you right away. I know that you're very savvy on how women are holding themselves back. Can you start talking about maybe one thing that right off the bat, you know, holds women back in their careers? Sure. I I think the thing that I notice that holds women back in their careers, no matter what level they're at, whether they're just starting out, whether they're uh, managers, whether they're they're at even a senior level, or even whether they are running their own businesses, is this um, need to do everything perfectly. Perfectionism really can stand in the way of women's ability to rise, women's ability to move up the corporate ladder, to build their careers, the sense that everything has to be right and their inability to let go of any mistakes they may have made. I I couldn't agree more. So when you talk about letting go of mistakes, I think you had mentioned before it's ruminating, right? So they're holding on. So give me an example of how they're they're holding on to things. Sure. Well, I think we all do it, right? You you first of all, it's human nature to focus more on our mistakes than what we do right. And that's kind of evolutionary um, science. I've, I've read quite a few articles on it. It's just natural. So I guess what I'm saying is do something unnatural, which is stop making your mistakes, stop blowing your mistakes out of proportion. Stop ruminating about your mistakes. Stop thinking, if only I had said this, then they would have done that. Or if only I had made a better presentation, I would have closed the deal. Or or anything else, if only, if only I hadn't um, gotten annoyed, you know, everything would be fine. And so I think we tend to focus on these mistakes and it can also be a mistake, like a, a mistake in a report or um, a mistake in a, a presentation or a meeting. And I, the research that I've read, and this seems to be true in real life, is that men seem to be able to let go of their mistakes and move forward much more easily than women can. Women tend to ruminate on what they did wrong. And I say, go against nature and stop ruminating. 
And I think that applies to our relationships as well too, right? Because I know my husband can let things go much quicker than I can as well. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's for sure, Rosie. Well, you know, one, thing, one, one thing I noticed, I got married a little bit late in life and I kept noticing that women who were married often had more tolerance for men who would talk and say things even if they weren't right. They just thought they were, were right and they would just move forward. Um, and also it is true. I've noticed that if my husband and I have a disagreement, the next minute he can act as if nothing happened and just move on. And I used to want to ruminate and go, well, why did you say that? Let's examine it. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy. You know, so, <laughs> yes. So men and women definitely have different ways of thinking, both about what is perfect, what's right, what they should say, whether or not they should express their ideas, uh, even if they're not 100% um, full, fully formed. Guys just seem to have an ability to push through that. I think that's quite... Uh start startling distinction between men and women and that's probably why women you know we're holding ourselves back now i know you had mentioned something about uh, women take on maybe too much work and they don't delegate is that part do you think of being perfect oh absolutely so part of perfectionism is thinking that you can do it better than someone else and or the other, the other way um, we think about it is by the time I teach someone how to do it, I could have done it myself. So that to me, that's very short-sighted for, because take the time to show someone else how, how, to, how to do something that you can delegate. And in the long run, they will be able to continue doing it. So um, it's, it's really a mistake to think that way. And it, when you don't delegate, you don't free yourself up to do the things that are really important that only you can do. So one step when, when you're caught in this kind of perfectionistic trap is to take a step back and break down whatever it is, whatever project you're working on um, and break it into small smaller parts and take a look at it and see, are there any parts of this project that someone else could do. I really like that. I think breaking it down and trying to identify what you're uniquely positioned to do yourself, I think that's gonna make a, make a big difference. Now, there's also a situation when people, when women, instead of making a statement about whatever they're talking about, they ask a question. Can you comment on that and why, why women do that or how it impacts their career? Sure. Well, I, I think we're, we're, it's part of how we're socialized, to, to, to tell you the truth. Um, and, and when you say ask a question, what's interesting is women may make a statement, but they go up at, at the end, they, they, they bring their voice up at the end of the sentence, which turns it into a question. It turns it into a question. So, you know, I just made it a statement, a question, just, just, just by how I um, raise my, my, my voice at the end. I think it goes back to this idea of being unsure of ourselves. But it's not that easy to just go out there and make statements. There, there's really a fine line that we are socialized to sense, both men and women, of is the woman being too pushy? Is she being bossy? What it's it's not this is not easy just because I say make a statement doesn't mean that you can just go into your next big big meeting and 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 blast out your statements. I think what I would recommend within the corporate structure is to look at women who are succeeding within your company and see how they make presentations and look to see how they speak. Some of it's going to be body language. Some of it is going to be whether or not they, they look people straight in the eye when, when they speak with them. So it's not just 
make a statement, but it's your whole presentation and understanding the subtleties of how both men and women feel a, about how women speak. It, it's tough, Rosie. It's yes. certainly not black and white. There's a lot of gray. Yeah, and I think that's exactly why we're having this conversation so that women are aware of the difficulties, but at the same time, you're giving valuable, actionable items that they can do. And just being aware of, of the fact that they might be speaking in questions instead of statements, I think that's going to be one thing that, you know, again, just people can be aware of that. Now, when, oh, the other thing that I was going to say, sometimes women say sorry a lot. Have you noticed that at all? Yes. So way, way back in my career, when I worked within a, a corporate structure before I started my own business, I ran into a situation where I thought I made a mistake. I was pretty young. So let's say I was in my mid twenties. And I remember calling back the person and apologizing. And I discovered it didn't make any difference. All it did was take a situation where I may or may not have been wrong and where another, it was a woman who got, who got annoyed with me. She may have been right or wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't really clear, but apologizing just made me wrong. It just totally made me wrong. So I think that ap apologies are necessary at certain times. You need to be careful about when you apologize. Do not apologize for every little thing. I uh, One of the women who worked with me for a long time as a publicist in my, in my public relations agency used to say she was sorry all the time. And I used to say to her, please st stop it. And one of the things that was really annoying to me as her manager, was she would think that by saying she was sorry, it was over. And I would say, okay, if you're sorry, I want the solution. I don't really need to know that you're sorry. I need the solution to fix whatever the problem was that you're apologizing for. Am I clear in what I'm saying, Rosie? Absolutely, you're absolutely clear. Now I do know, and I have heard women myself say, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? And I always think like, why are you sorry to ask a question? So whenever I am able to give someone a little bit of feedback, I specifically call that out. Don't apologize, don't apologize for asking a question. You know, like you said, apologize when it's warranted, but don't apologize just because you're sending an email or maybe you don't want to bother somebody. So I think that's a, that's a very valid point. I, I wanted to jump in here. Um, I think uh, two comments. One, I find it interesting that, a, that you've, you've seen women apologize to ask a question. And here we were earlier talking about the fact that women don't, don't need to ask so many questions. They can be making statements. And I have a feeling that what you're referring to is a woman saying, I'm sorry, but I don't quite understand what you were saying. Because the truth is, she knows that what was being said was wrong or didn't make sense. So in, instead of being able to say, that doesn't quite make sense to me, or it seems like there might be a better solution, because again, I'm very solution oriented. She uses this commentary of saying, I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Um, Maybe there's a, a different way of saying it. So, could we get? Uh, can you clarify? That? Can you clarify your point? Might might be another way to say it. But I, I really want to harp on this. If you are about to say you're sorry for something that you did, or something your team did, or something that happened, the second part is what is the solution? Sorry should be you should have a cross out sorry and have a big sign that says solution. I love that. I think that's, again, very actionable. Now, another way that women are holding themselves back is by not putting themselves out there. What, what have you seen or what have you observed about women not putting themselves out there? 
the biggest problem I see, particularly with younger women, and to me, that's women in their 20s, 30s, maybe early 40s, is they speak too softly, especially in a group setting. And when often in a meeting, you're at, you know, uh, people don't know each other and you have to go around the room and say who you are. Um, and, and women will explain who they are using that question. I'm a publicist. I'm a publicist. Yeah, I, you know, I can't quite do it because yeah. I, I try not to talk that way. Right. Um, but they talk, they speak so softly that even if people can hear them, they come across as in secure. So one of the things that, that I, I, I tell women, especially when I'm mentoring college students or young women just entering the workforce, is to use a deep voice. Speak, you know, speak from your chest. Don't, don't keep it all squeaky up here. You know, pro project and make sure people know who you are, but can believe in you. And uh, again, it's a question of presence. And here I am, if you look at my hands, I'm a little bit low in this camera, but look at how I'm talking. I'm, I'm projecting out saying who I am. So think about your body language, your posture, how, whether or not you're looking at everybody that you're speaking with, tell them who you are, tell them what your ideas are. Exactly, okay, great. Now. What about someone that is working really hard and is waiting for somebody to notice that they're working hard, but they're not saying anything about it? Do you, yeah. have you seen, have you seen that happen? All the time, of course. <laughs> I think women fall into this category more than men do because women don't want to brag. Uh, don't want to talk about themselves. Again, based on research that I've read, um, it's, a, it's one of those tough situations because we, both men and women, are socialized to see women who are talking about their accomplishments often as, as, as bragging or being full of themselves. So it's a bit of a difficult line to tread, but I would say err on the side of saying what you've done. So one of the ways that this happens would be if you're a team leader and, it's, and, or, and you don't, you give all the credit to your team and you take no responsibility for what you've done. So it depends on the situation. Maybe that in a one-to-one -one meeting with your manager, that's the time to tell your manager what you've done. In, in a group situation with the rest of the team there, it, it, it may be more advisable to speak in the we, but if there's any way that you can show your leadership in, in, in that presentation, you, you should show, you, you need to express it. Again, I would look to other women who do this well as role models, because it's not that easy to do. Right. So you need to look for women to emulate within your organization and support each other, because otherwise, like you said, if you're not speaking up for yourself. Maybe another woman notices your hard work and they can put a good word in for you or say, hey, you did a great job in this particular project. Make sure that you tell your manager or something. You know, we just need to bounce ideas off of each other. And I believe you, you kind of mentioned this last time that we spoke is to build a team around you. So how, how would you suggest women can actually start building a team around them? Yeah. I, I think the first step is, is to try to get to know other, other people within your company. Look around, see who's doing well, and, and see who, who you can have coffee with. Don't push it. Don't, don't be you know, obnoxious and don't be needy. You need to be giving them something in return for them giving you something. So I want to give you a concrete example of how I see this working. If you're going into a meeting, and you want to present a new idea or a new strategy, or you think that something, something needs to be changed, do not go into that meeting without having gotten some allies. So before you go into the meeting, you need to start talking to people and sense what is it that they're thinking. Do, tell them your ideas. See, start to get a little feedback so that you can 
find the best way to present your idea or what I call position your idea, what resonates with people. And then when you go into your meeting, if people, if a couple of people in the meeting are already supportive of that idea, that's where the comments are gonna come up like good idea. Where, because because uh, again, this is based on research. What you see in meetings is a woman can give present an idea and it's like, nobody hears it. And then a, a minute later, a male colleague presents the same idea and everybody says, that's great, but she just presented it. So if, if you can um, garner support for your idea, your ideas before the meeting that works or just go, or, or just have a quick pre-meeting, just, just to say, hey, here's, I see this is the agenda. What do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? You, you, I, I say don't go into meetings cold, especially, especially important meetings. Uh, that's one. The other thing is, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, everything's changed, Rosie, right? Hybrid workplaces, we're working from home. We're not seeing each other that much. So it used to be you would go have lunch with people, right? You'd say, hey, let's go to the cafeteria. Uh, you know, let's go get a bite to eat. Do you want to have, a, a, you want to meet for coffee? Do you want to have a drink or invite someone to dinner? What, what you, I would say you create allies by socializing with them and, and getting to know them a little bit and, and don't rush it. But, but think about a step-by-step -step way for people to get to know who you are and for you to get to know who they are and, and, and find a ways that you can be supportive of each other and avoid people who bring you down. Avoid people who somehow figure out what your buttons are and they start pushing them and you know, where you're not sure about something and, and, and you know, you're around somebody who just kind of figures out what that is and just keeps pushing that button and makes you feel really insecure, please stay away from those people. Absolutely. I'm curious, did you have that experience where people were kind of pushing your buttons as, as you were coming up in your career? I certainly did. <laughs> <laughs> many times, many, okay. many, many times. Um, you know, I've been, I've, I've been working for it a very, very long time, long before we had email, even before we had fax machines. So um, <laughs> I've been around a long time. And one of the great things about getting a lot of experience is you actually get smarter at, at interpersonal relationships and you start to understand what's happening better. But um, I remember early in my career, one of, one of my biggest problems was a woman who was the head of another department. So I worked in book publishing. I was the head of the publicity marketing department. She was head of a completely different department, but for some reason she decided she was my boss and she used to tell me what to do. And I used to get into these battles with her, which were a huge waste of time. And I couldn't I just couldn't not engage with her. Now I, I wouldn't engage, but it was it was it was not good for my career because the senior people in the in the company at that time were all men, and what they saw were two women sort of catfighting or not getting along, and so they didn't take either one of us seri seriously enough. It's kind of interesting because I ended up leaving that company and going on to another book publisher. And in the end, that company almost went bankrupt. It was a 100 year old book publisher that was being run into the ground by a bunch of guys who thought they knew everything. It was kind of interesting. Okay. All right. Well, that is an interesting story. I want to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier, as far as if a woman uh, speaks an idea nobody hears her. But if a male counterpart says the same idea a minute later, they hear him. Why do you think that is? I am not a psych psychologist. I do not know. Yeah. I, 
but but we see this over and over and over again in research. And I I mean, I've experienced it. I was at a meeting maybe three years ago. It was obviously before COVID, a big conference room. And there was a, a, a man running the meeting, a VC guy. So he, you know, he had just invested in a huge tech company, which I will not name, which probably now makes him a billionaire. But he was running the meeting and there were about 20 of us uh, and a, a bunch of women who look, who were younger than, uh, than I was, but they looked like they were in their, let's say, 30s. So they were mid-career, just starting to have managerial positions, bunch of guys the same age. And I heard the women, A, ask questions instead of making statements and B, present ideas that the man running the meeting totally didn't hear. And then a guy, a young, a young man in his thirties would make the same statement and the, and the man running the, the meeting would hear it. I have no idea why, but it happens. Yes, I, I'm gonna have to research that more because I am curious as to what is the psychology that happens in that particular situation. Jane, I know you, you refer to uh, people as thought leaders. What makes a person a thought leader and what could that do for their careers? A thought, okay, a, a real thought leader is somebody who has some great and unique ideas. So um, in my life, I've met a lot of thought leaders, Charles Schwab, who created Charles Schwab and company, look at what he did. He had this great idea about making investing easier for the average person. Um, and he created, then he created a whole online um, brokerage com company. It, he was cutting edge, he was a thought leader. But other thought leaders that I've, that I've worked with or I'm working with now, usually in, in business, usually have observations about the way things work or the way people behave or the way to be successful or the way to have better relationships or the way to lose weight, make money, be loved, that, that they can express in a way that other people can hear and can absorb and do something with that information. Now, a lot of time thought leaders really are breaking through with new ideas like Daniel Goleman who broke through with the idea of emotional intelligence, right? That's real thought leadership because he came up with this concept of our understanding of other people, uh, how our understanding of other people um, impacts our careers and, and our lives, et cetera. But I think you can be a thought leader just by like doing the things I'm talking about, observing that women aren't always heard in meetings. And I did some research on it and I keep seeing this come up over and over and over again. So when I articulate it, it you know, it, it's part of my thought leadership. So I think to be a thought leader, you need to be observant. If, if you're in academia, you need to be doing research. If you work with a company where you can do research or a survey and, and you have a new information or new results, that's really good. But you also have to write. You need to put your thought leadership um, in blogs, in articles. You need to try to get it published. Um, you, I mean, you could write an article that you post on LinkedIn. You could have a personal blog. You, you could do it through social media. You can write a book. But your, your thought leadership needs to be concrete. And I'll, I'll say written out in some form. Okay. And so people can start um, within their teams, right? So they can actually observe things that are maybe aren't, aren't working within their teams, come up with process improvements, better ways of doing whatever it is that they're doing, bring it to their managers. And that's to me, a baby step to becoming a thought leader because they observe things that they can improve. They try to bring a solution and then bring it to somebody's attention so they can improve on whatever it is that they're trying to improve. That's um, the first steps towards being a leader. Okay. Uh Thought leader really refers to what I'm talking about, where you're um, 
articulating your ideas for a broader a, a, a broader uh, audience. Um, but if you want to be a thought leader within your company, it, I would say, yes, you bring these ideas up, but there's but you also write them down. So there's a memo, there's an email, there's some documentation that can be saved um, with your thought leadership. Otherwise, especially as a woman, what happens? Nobody hears, right? Mm-hmm. So you want you want to document um, your thought leadership. Got it. All right, that that's a good clarification there, Jane. The last thing I'm going to ask you is, can you just give us a uh, maybe a couple minutes overview of some of the challenges that you had to overcome in your career? <laughs> You're throwing that one at me. <laughs> Yeah, my, I've had such a long career, Rosie. I would say insecurity in the early stages, being insecure. Um, I think not always paying enough attention to where other people were coming from, not understanding the other person's point of view well enough. Um, I think getting into little turf battles uh, was, a mis- was a mistake. I think things that really helped me were, were aligning myself with the right people, doing a good job, letting people know about it and aligning myself with the right mentors and managers and making sure I had support for what for what I was doing. Got it. Okay, sounds great. All right, very last thing. Can you provide us with two actionable tips that people can implement in their careers that they can, you know, easily start implementing them, you know, in their careers. Okay. So that we've already discussed one of them, which is my belief that you should surround yourself with positive people or look at it the way that I described it before. Um, don't, don't try to do everything on your own. Don't do it. Don't be single hand. Don't try to do everything in a single-handed way. Um, make sure that that you test your ideas on other people and get your create a, a tribe. And a tribe might be one person, might be five people, maybe what we call a posse. But surround yourself with positive people and look for ways to find allies in your workplace and and be their ally too. It's not just about you. It's about what you're going to help them do because people can rise together. This is not a zero sum game. Careers are not zero sum games. It's it's about everybody building their careers together. It's about teams being effective and growing together. So that's so so that's one thing is really is is surround yourself with positive people. Um, the other thing is if you are overwhelmed by a project, if you feel stressed because you think it has to be perfect and therefore it just seems so gigantic that you can't possibly get it done, please break it down into smaller steps and figure out or, or say to yourself, what is the one thing I can do now or today that will start moving this project forward. Choose that one thing. It may be something very, very simple like writing an outline for a report or just putting down a couple of sentences to get a memo going. Or it may be identifying the person who can help you get the job done. But break down the job into smaller parts and ask yourself, what can I do now to move forward. I like those tips. Those are great tips, Jane. Okay. So any final words before we call it a day with our podcast for today? Tap into your, tap into your own brilliance. Mm -hmm. Think about what you're really good at doing. Go for it. Make sure that you play to your brilliance. Don't play to your shortcomings. I love that. All right, Jane, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you and uh, lending us your time. Okay, that was such a great and enlightening conversation with Jane Westman. I know I learned a lot and I hope that you did too. I want to recap the two tips that Jane provided us during our conversation. The first tip is 
Surround yourself with positive people. It could be one person or it could be five people, such as a posse. The one quote that I wanted to bring to your attention that Jane said was, people can rise together. I think that's very true. You are looking for allies, but you can be an ally together. So Jane said that it's about building careers together. So that's tip number one. And tip number two is that if you are overwhelmed by a project and you're so stressed out because you think it needs to be perfect and it's such an enormous project, then the tip is break it down into smaller steps. So it could be as simple as writing, starting to write an outline or writing the first couple of sentences of a memo that you need to write, but essentially break down the project into smaller steps so that you can start moving that project forward. So that is tip number two. So if you are interested in learning more about this conversation, please, by all means, email me. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on all the social media. And all of my contact information will be in my blog. So with that, I think that's a wrap. Remember to be brave, be bold, and take action. Until next time. Thank you for listening to this episode. Let these stories of self-encouragement and professional development serve as a guide in navigating through corporate America in the most practical and fulfilling way possible. Do not forget to subscribe to the show at nowomanleftbehind.com for more content like this. Leave a rating and share it with your friends because we want to make sure that no woman is left behind. Until I see you next time, remember to be brave, be bold, and take action.